Welcome, everyone. This is the second program we're having for our Silver Jubilee year, the 25th anniversary of our center, which coincides with the 125th anniversary of the Ramakrishna Martin mission. So it's kind of a double celebration year. And we're very, very happy that Swami Sarva Priyanandaji is here for uh, today and tomorrow's Sunday morning lecture. A uh, few little things I want to say in the beginning. We apologize for not being able to serve food and, and have our singing and do everything the way we usually do because of the pandemic. When we first planned for this event, everything was getting better. And then the next thing we knew, they were recommending masks again and everything. So we request everyone to please keep your mask on uh, the whole time you're inside, and uh, we'll have a box lunches for people to take uh, when the morning program is over. If you walk out these doors, there'll be a table. All the lunches will be there. We have some chairs set up outside. Otherwise, just make the best of it. Find a place to sit or uh, whatever. And uh, even the tea and coffee we're suspending this time, uh, just, just for safety for everyone. So again, we apologize for all of that. The uh, first session, uh, Swamiji will speak on the divine within. If, if, if ever we had a Swami that didn't, didn't need an introduction, it's Swami Sarva Priyanandaji. <laughs> but if there's anybody who doesn't know, Swamiji is the head of our Vedanta Society of New York. He came to this country some years ago as the assistant to Swami Sarva Devanandaji in Southern California and then became head of our New York Center. And uh, I would say that he's most responsible for spreading the name of Sri Ramakrishna and, and Vedanta in this country and other countries. There's not another person who's done as much as he's done. So we're very, very grateful for uh, the tremendous work that started in, in India. Uh, with uh, IIT Kanpur, huh? was that, that's where everything started. And uh, the Swamiji became so popular that uh, thousands and thousands of people watch him on YouTube. Everyone knows that. So we're very, very happy <coughs> that Swamiji has come. The first session is on the divinity within. And uh, at the end of that session, uh, we'll have the lunches ready for everyone. We have something called bhajans at 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. We were hoping to have some group singing also, but that's not going to happen. So we may have a few soloists who come. There may be some music. Otherwise, it'll be just a quiet period if anybody wants to sit here or walk on the grounds. And then second talk will be on oneness. That'll be 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And we have a tea break. We'll, we'll see, uh, but possibly that'll just be another break. We can put some snacks and things out, but anyhow, uh, everything will, will be outside also. Then the, a question and answer session from five to six, and we have uh, some pieces of paper here, and uh, we have extra pens that we'll put there. So write down a question so that you don't have to ask, and then Swamiji will go through those during that, that period. And then anybody who would like to stay for evening arati, 6.30 in meditation, you're welcome to stay. But the final program will be that uh, question and answer session. And then tomorrow, Swamiji will give the, the main Sunday morning talk. That'll be 11 o'clock, Vedanta in the 21st century. So, Maharaj, please come. Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 
Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Good morning, everybody. My pranams to Revered Swami Atma Gyananandaji and pranams and namaskars to all the other monastics and namaste to all of you, dear friends. Thank you for turning out in such large numbers in spite of the renewed effect of the pandemic. Um, today, it's a great pleasure for me, as always, uh, to come back to this very beautiful place. I was just thinking, this is a house made of love for God. Uh, so you feel it here, a, a divine presence. We need more such spaces, I think. To gather here today to speak about deep things, the most profound things that humanity has ever thought about, experienced. And the goal is also very deep, very profound. In Sanskrit, Atyantika Dukkha Nivritti Paramananda Praptischa, the utter cessation of sorrow and attainment of the ultimate fulfillment, of the ultimate bliss. The goal of life, what we are all trying to do. There is a wise way of do it, doing it, and somebody remarked in a quip, there's an otherwise way of doing it. <laughs> so we have all tried the otherwise ways of doing it, and we've been trying it all our lives. And uh, he, we gather here for the wise way of doing it. Now the wise way of doing it should be rather called the wise ways of doing it. There are many ways. I don't at all claim that Advaita Vedanta is uh, all of spirituality. Uh, there are multiple ways, and the different ways are based on different worldviews, different views of the spiritual problem and the spiritual solution. So there is a way of bhakti, of devotion, and this is well known. It is when you come across the religions of the world, especially the theistic religions, God exists. You don't believe in God, that's the problem. So belief in God is the solution. Faith in God is the solution. In fact, so much so in this country. The name for religion is faith. So that is, but that's one way. One way is devotion, love. Now when I'm distinguishing the ways, um, remember, it's not one or the other. All of these are very valuable and all of these form part of our spiritual life. But it's good to know the uniqueness of each approach. So we're going to talk about a very particular approach today. So one way is there is God, belief in God, faith in God is the solution. God will take care of you, will give you whatever is necessary, the highest realization, liberation, transcendence of suffering, whatever our goal is, God will do that for us. But we must hold on to God and surrender to God. Then the next one is, See, the problem with the God-oriented approach is a question of faith. And in this day and age of age of skepticism, that becomes problematic sometimes. Even if we think we have faith, uh, the questions will always come up. <coughs> um, as uh, somebody was saying, you know, that uh, in this day and age, if you, this is a, an age where there is the largest number of of um, agnostics and non-believers in God ever in history. There always have been atheists, always have been skeptics. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. There always have been atheists and skeptics, but never in so many numbers. You know? And uh, you run up against a challenge like, you know, you have to debate with Christopher Hitchens or Daniel Dennett or Richard Dawkins. And, the militant atheists, you know, attacking faith, the concept of faith. But then there is another path to spirituality, not the path of belief in God, which is a true path and does work, but it starts with faith. If you start with skepticism, if you start with questions, then the path of faith will not work for you, by definition. There's another path, the path of experience, um, that God can be experienced. That's what transformed Narendranath Dutta into Swami Vivekananda. He went around asking, have you seen God? Not whether you believe in God or why should I believe in God, but have you seen God? And he got an answer from him. 
from Sri Ramakrishna. He said, yes, I have, straightforward. And so honest, so direct, so convincing that he became Sri Ramakrishna's disciple and Vivekananda, and that's why we are all here today, thankfully. <laughs> but that was the question was a question of the age, an empirical age, where we demand experience. Swami Vivekananda came here and said, if God exists, I should be able to see God. If I have an immortal soul, I should be able to feel it. And Sri Ramakrishna's answer and the answer of yoga, Patanjali yoga is, yes, you can, not faith, not taking it on belief. But here are the methods, practice these methods, and you will get certain experiences which will validate the claims of religion. So this is the yogic approach. Now notice there's a problem with this also. The problem is the yogic approach promises you certain extraordinary experiences. Our day-to-day -day quotidian experiences will not, you know, will not make the mark. They will not convince us that God exists. It's something extraordinary, a vision of God, which is utterly convinces the yogi. But for the rest of us, either people remain skeptical, they're puzzled, or some become devoted, they take it on faith that this is true. When Sri Ramakrishna, in the, you see, when the descriptions of Sri Ramakrishna having visions of, um, of Kali, but notice one thing, the people around him, they're all standing in respectful silence or in amazement when he's in Samadhi. They are not seeing Kali. And the problem with that situation is, which mystics throughout the ages have faced, what did most people, how do most people react to a mystic? How did most people react to Sri Ramakrishna? He's mad. This guy is crazy. He claims to be seeing God. How can people challenge this? They can challenge it because they are not having those experiences. It's not a publicly shared experience. We are having a publicly shared experience now. So nobody needs to convince any of us that there is a room and we are sitting in this room, that we have bodies. We even have private inner experiences because we all have that. So we don't need to be convinced about it. But I'm seeing God. I think it was David Hume who said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So that's the problem. And in today's age, a neuroscientist will say, will not say that you're crazy, that's not politically correct anymore. They'll say that, we don't doubt, Swami, you are having a wonderful experience of oneness with the universe. But you are having it because there is a little clot in your brain on that hemi hemisphere, and it's a blockage, and there's some leakage of blood into a certain place, and you makes you feel that way. We don't deny you are feeling one with the universe. That doesn't mean you are one with the universe. We don't deny that you think you are seeing God, but that doesn't mean that you are seeing God. And there are varieties of this. Nowadays it's very popular now. You know, at one time it was taking drugs like LSD to induce experiences. That's what got, I think, Richard Alpert kicked out of Harvard at one time. And now it's back again. There's one drug called psilocybin, I think. And so there are uh, researchers actual very serious brain researchers taking this and having various kinds of experiences, that does not mean it corresponds to reality. It's just stimulating the brain and getting some experiences. So that might be a doubt. That might be a charge leveled against the path of mystical experience. Now, having delineated these two paths, these two broad paths, a path of faith, a path of actual um, practices which, which give rise to certain psychic experiences, which prove, actually they do, and all of these paths are valid. Actually, they do work. Here, the reason I'm making this, these distinctions is I want to um, concentrate on a particular path today, which is the path of Advaita Vedanta, the path of knowledge. It does not say you have to believe. In fact, it says that you shouldn't believe. It's like you're going to a, a classroom and learning physics and the teacher writes down an equation and says, do you get it? And if you respond, so I don't get it, but you are great, and so I believe you. <laughs> that won't work. <laughs> knowledge is being transferred there. You must get it. So in the path of knowledge, we must get it. Even intellectually, we must begin to understand. Then. It's not even a, a matter of a particular mystical experience. See, Advaita Vedanta, the path of um, knowledge, 
it is based on experience but what experience our quotidian experience our daily experience it's the experience of you know with something everybody has all the time the basic structure of all experience subject and object who is it here who does not see hear smell taste touch who is it here who doesn't have experience a body and a mind if you have that much who is it here that who doesn't experience waking dreaming deep sleep we all have that and that's all that is necessary for the path of knowledge to begin that's all the, the experience that's necessary the rest of it will come through a special method called vichara what is vichara it's a method of spiritual philosophical inquiry vichara it's a sanskrit word an inquiry a philosophical inquiry a spiritual philosophical inquiry inquiry into what inquiry into our already available experience and the upanishads the fundamental texts of advaita vedanta they guide us in this inquiry they initiate the inquiry what you have to do is and just today after breakfast um a scholar was asking me that is all thinking you know you can sort of delude yourself into thinking that you have uh, realized or you have understood something It's still thinking what about experience it's actually all the time based on experience let me suggest a word instead of thinking instead of reasoning which can sort of feel like you're doing some kind of speculative philosophy let's use the word noticing noticing is always linked to rooted to anchored in experience noticing noticing what will you notice and the conclusions that you draw from it will be given by vedanta so that's what we are going to do what is this unique path as distinguished from um belief or faith or worship that's one odd meditative techniques to get special unique experiences that's two but what is this unique path of vichara uh, inquiry what we are looking for here what we are trying to find out or discover uh, does not involve any kind of a physical journey it's not about going to heaven or some such place you know vaikuntha or some other loka some other world uh, some other perfect place no brahman the ultimate reality that vedanta speaks about is um, everywhere and it's here it's not even a journey in time that you have to wait and after death i saw a big billboard it says after death ominously rather after death you will see god but notice the word after it's a time word not now then not here there but vedanta says not not just the there definitely there but here also here and there and everywhere now and then and every when and it's also not something else apart from you that we are not going to seek some other reality some other god some other being apart from you if it's everywhere if it's every when it must be here it must be now it is everything so it must be me also in fact it's not even that if you go deeper it's only by accepting space we say uh, god is everywhere uh, rather space itself uh, is an appearance in brahman it's by accepting time the time exists then only we talk about as if it's all the time as if brahman or the ultimate reality is something that exists for a pretty long time no rather time itself is an appearance in brahman we will see all that it is by accepting the existence of all objects and things that we say god is everything or brahman is everything rather all objects and things are not brahman only is this is literally what swami vivekananda you know uh, there was this exchange of poetry with mary hale and she wrote that you have taught i have understood what you have taught you have taught that god is everything and swami vivekananda wrote back saying that i never taught such strange doctrine that god is everything and she was astonished you said it that god is everything and he said no what i meant was that um, everything is not god only is what you see as everything and that is actually the reality of god now all of these words i am using very carefully they will all become pretty clear uh, over the course of today all pervading eternal and non-dual non-dual means no second reality apart from our real nature 
So it's an inquiry. So what is this spiritual journey then? If it's not a journey in space, not a journey in time, not a journey from one thing to another thing, it's a journey from ignorance to knowledge, from not realizing to realizing. And the, the, what will take us on this journey is vichara, the path of inquiry, which we are going to talk about today. Now this vichara, we all know what Advaita Vedanta wants to tell us. We have heard it again and again. Doesn't it tell you that you are that ultimate reality? You are Brahman. Tattvamasi, that thou art. You know, the sentence is taken from the Upanishads. They're called Mahavakyas, profound sentences, the great utterances, which sum up the entire teaching of Vedanta. That thou art. Tattvamasi. Uh, I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. Pragyanam Brahma. Consciousness, awareness is Brahman, the absolute reality. I am Atma Brahma. This very self is Brahman. And they all mean the same thing. You are Brahman. I am Brahman. This very self is Brahman. This awareness, our own the awareness we feel all the time, that is Brahman. They all mean the same thing. So these are the, this is the essential teaching of Advaita Vedanta that it tells us. Now, how do we understand this? How do we realize it? And what benefit does it give us? So this is the this is the subject today. It doesn't get any deeper than this, any more profound than this. Before I launch into it, I haven't started, that means. <laughs> this was all, in Bengali they say, Gaur Chandrika. That means a little initial performance before we go into the actual teaching. Um, before we go into that, I must fulfill my duty by pointing out the fourfold qualifications, the fourfold practices, as I like to call them. Sadhan Chatushtai. There is certain basic mindset preparation that is necessary for Advaita Vedanta. And we tend to skip over that. I also often, when I teach, I skim over that, but it's important. It's important, and we realize it's important when we are fairly far along, when we have read the books, known the arguments, tried our best. And then we say, it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work because you ignored the entry conditions. And we'll have to go back there. Swami Vivekananda says, I know where the shoe pinches. So we have to go back there. What are these uh, conditions? What are these preparations? And remember, they are action words. They're something that we can do and, and get better at. One is called uh, Viveka. Viveka means to discern. Our old Swamis translated this as to discriminate between the eternal and non-eternal. To discriminate now is a bad word. So to discern. Discern is actually a more precise translation of Viveka. To discern the eternal from the non-eternal. That there is some absolute reality, some ultimate meaning in life, some, some God, Brahman, Tao, Allah, something is there. Uh, which the spiritual traditions of the world declare that there is some reality. That much. Compared to which, the things of the world, the passing things of the world, are, are transitory, are unfulfilling, are unsatisfying. And this is shown to, to me by my own experience in life till now, and by the experience of life of the people I see around and I read about in history. The transitoriness of power, transitoriness of wealth, of health, of life itself. Coming and going and floating like dreams, that is viveka, that there is some reality to be attained. The second, vairagya, that reality to be attained is most worthwhile. And the rest of it which I have been engaged in is not fulfilling, is not worthwhile. I will continuously be engaged in it, but in itself, the world cannot satisfy what I want from the world. And it's not the world's fault. As we shall see, the world was not designed to give you ultimate satisfaction. So, this is called vairagya, a dispassion for the, for the material things that the world offers us. And an intense focus. Sri Ramakrishna says, Ishwari anurag, bishaya virag. Uh, intense love or uh, attraction towards God, or spiritual life. And a dispassion for worldliness. Second, this is called vairagya. Third, a set, a little bit of cheating here. Instead of third, we are putting in six <laughs> in that called Shat Sampatti, the sixth fold treasure. But these are basically disciplines for calming and focusing the mind. The first one is Shamaha, quietening the mind. Don't be restless. Then Damaha, 
don't be physically restless, quietening and bringing under control our organs of action. And then there is titiksha, a spiritual fortitude, a toughness that come what may, COVID or whatever, uh, I, will, uh, I will pursue Vedanta, I will pursue spiritual life. A certain toughness. You see, imagine how much trouble we undertake in life to raise a family, to hold on to a job. How much trouble? How much suffering? With less suffering and less trouble than that, you can become enlightened. No, no, really. Swami Brahmananda says that. Uh, with less suffering. Then you would tell the young people coming to the monastery to uh, join the, join, become monks. He says with the amount of effort you put into a, you know, passing an examination, <laughs> with less effort than that, you can realize God. <laughs> but some effort is definitely necessary. Titiksha, toughness, spiritual toughness. I will do it. Then there is um, uparati, a pulling back from too much involvement in the world. If I'm partying all, you know, working all week and partying hard all weekends, then there's no time or energy left over for Vedanta. <laughs> so uparati, pulling back. And one sadhu said in the Himalayas, I'll translate from Hindi, he said, jo sadhan hai na mahatma ji, ye thoda hat ke hota hai. So spiritual life, you have to step back. He says, oh monk, all spiritual life involves a little stepping back from too much worldly involvement. Then, samadhana. You have stepped back, you have got time and energy now, focus, settle down. Settle down on Vedanta, on your spiritual path. And then shraddha, a little um, faith, working faith, that what the teacher is telling me, what the text tells me, what the tradition tells me, something worthwhile there, let me pursue it, and I will get results. So shraddha. And this, these are the six all of it may, uh, helps us to focus the mind, calm down the mind and focus it. Then the last of the four, if you remember, don't get lost. Four practices in between the third had six. Then the fourth one is mumukshutvam, an intense desire for freedom. Now, this seems like a tall order. It isn't. We, we all, sorry, we all have um, quite a bit of it already. Uh, I mean, I know how much trouble many of you have taken to travel from distant places in the midst of this pandemic, to come and listen to this. This shows that we are willing to make sacrifices, willing to pursue this truth. So we have the, the control the, to sit quietly, listen and attend and absorb. We have the, the passion to follow it up. We just need to um, take it up a few notches more. The fourfold qualifications. Now, we still haven't started. All right. Let's make a beginning. The subject matter, they said the divinity within, and then I said oneness, the next uh, talk, as Swamiji announced. It comes from what Swami Vivekananda said. His famous, very well-known definition of religion. Religion is the manifestation of the divinity already within us. So the divinity within, the manifestation of that, he says, is religion. And we are going to do it by a particular method, which is the philosophical spiritual inquiry called vichara. Remember, I'm not saying that you don't need to meditate. You stop meditating at your own peril. I'm not saying that you don't need to have devotion. Shankaracharya wrote some, the, some of the best devotional hymns ever. There is no contradiction. Not only that, even classical Advaita Vedanta, which is very strong on inquiry and knowledge, it strongly recommends that you have uh, devotion to uh, Brahman with qualities, that is the God of religion. That helps. Um, again, I'm not saying that one should not engage in work and service. Again, you stop doing that at your own peril. Because Advaita Vedanta won't work without this. Classical Advaita Vedanta says this. Shankara says this in other commentaries. Without this support, that knowledge which we're looking for, that method of inquiry, will not take hold. Will not, wo will not work. Um, in Hindi, the sadhus, they say, it's not assimilated. You eat food, rich food, and then you don't assimilate it, then it's no good. You just get a tummy upset. So to assimilate that, this kind of preparation is necessary. All right. The divinity within, Swami Vivekananda said, and that's what we're going to talk about. And in another place he says that my mission in life can be put in a few words. It is to teach unto humanity their inner divinity, and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. And the second thing he talked about was the oneness of all existence. 
So these two, if you put them together, you get Advaita Vedanta. So divinity within, what does it mean? And the oneness of all existence. What does it mean? How do you realize it? What good is it? The first step we need to take is the inquiry, the vichara into who am I? Because Advaita Vedanta tells me I am Brahman, the absolute reality. What is this Brahman? I have no idea. And I certainly don't feel like Brahman. So our problem is we already have a clear idea or at least we feel we have clarity about who we are. So the moment Vedanta tells me that you are not this, you are that, I resist it because I think I know uh, who I am. Like Mark Twain, incomparable Mark Twain said, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you think that you know that gets you into trouble. <laughs> we think we know who we are. So that's where Advaita Vedanta begins. An attack on our preconceived notion. This unexamined notion of what I think I am. And that's what's getting me into all the trouble that we, I am I'm in, in, this, in samsara. The question that what am I, this question, who am I, what am I? There's where, uh, that's where Advaita Vedanta begins. But that's not Advaita Vedanta. I'll caution you. What we will do now is just the first step. And the second step which we'll take in the afternoon session, that is non-dual Vedanta. That's the point that Vedanta is trying to make. That's where it gets really difficult, really profound, and really subtle. And I'm saying that in advance so that you don't, you know, take the lunchbox, let's go home. I've had enough of philosophy. So <laughs> Then you don't get anything. This is preparatory, but what, I, what Vedanta wants to point out, that's going to come after lunch. So you're going to have to wait. But without this, what we're going to do now? Without this, nothing will work. The inquiry into who am I or what am I? I think I know who am I or what am I? And then Vedanta says, you know. Pray, do, tell us. What do you think you are? Point, it, point yourself out to us. Here. This is who I am. Now Vedanta begins from our preconceived feeling that I am this thing. You know, what are you? Point yourself out. Here. What is this? It is I. What, what will happen now is Vedanta will give us certain, what looks like arguments. These are arguments designed to appeal to our understanding, but they are not mathematical proofs. They are more like, you know, lawyers argue to persuade the judge and the jury. So they are like persuaders to get you to see not in this way, but in another way. And what do you do with this? The methodology of vichara, of inquiry, is shravana manana nididhyasana. Threefold. Hearing, reflecting, meditating. Basically, this is how you learn anything. You, you turn up in class and you uh, listen to the teacher, read the textbooks, you think about it, and then the professor will say, you don't get it. No. You sit with it. Sit with it quietly, what you have read and what you have reasoned about. You'll get it. You'll make the breakthrough. That's exactly it. Shravana manana nididhyasana. I was so happy to hear the Tibetan monk say that our method in Tibetan Buddhism is hearing, reflecting, meditation. I said, perfect. This is exactly it. And it has to be like that. What else could it be? Again, you said, did you say meditation, but didn't you say we are not on the path of meditation? Remember, meditation is not by itself. It's meditation based on what you have reasoned about, which is based on what you have heard. So what you have heard or studied is the foundation. Shravana is the foundation. It's like going to class and saying, oh, the teacher told me, you'll need to listen to me and think about it and then sit real quiet with it and then you get it. So let me jump to the last one. I'll just sit really quiet. I won't go to the class. I won't read the books. I won't think about it. I'll just sit really quiet. Will I learn physics? No. You'll fall asleep. That's what's going to happen to you. <laughs> so Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. Listen to the argument, ask yourself, what was the argument first? Second, did I get it? Or I had some questions. That's the second stage. Finally, is it real for me? Is it a fact? Or does it sound theoretical? So three questions. What did he say? Do I get it? Do I understand it? And third, is it a fact? Notice. Not just thinking, notice. Is it a fact? Body. Am I this body? Immediately, the first 
uh, argument is introduced. Notice that the body changes. Um, one great philosopher of ancient India, Vachaspati Mishra, who lived a thousand years ago, at the beginning of his commentary on Shankaracharya's commentary on the Brahma Sutras of Badrayana, uh, he says, I who sat, who played on the lap of my grandfather as a little child, now I look down on my lap is my grandson, and I see the body of that little child who I was, and this body of this old man. These are so very different, and yet I'm fully convinced I was that little kid in that little kid's body, and here I am. So, I am the same, and the body changes so much from birth to babyhood to childhood to teenage to youth to middle age to old age and to death. The body changes so much, and I say, I am there. I, the same one. Same one means unchanging one. Unchanging one and a changing body. How can changing and unchanging be literally the same thing? It can't be. It's like somebody's running past you, and you catch hold of it. You want to st stand steady. Now, if the other one is running, it, he'll pull you along. You can't yoke unchanging and changing together. One sadhu in Uttarakhand said, Nitya or Anitya may koi sampark nahi hota hai Mahatma ji. Of the eternal and the non-eternal, from the unchanging and the changing, there can be no relationship. It, if there is, it's, it's superimposed, it's an appearance, it's an error. So changing, ever-changing body. Doctors ch tell us that in seven years, every cell of the body is replaced. Over the years, every bit of it's a stream of matter continuously flowing through the body. Which bit of it are you? I'm all of it. I'm the kid and the old man also. Literally, you are not actually. The, the two bodies are physically, literally different. Then how can you be both? So changing and unchanging cannot be the same thing. I cannot, if I'm unchanging, whatever I am, I cannot be the changing body. The body is there, but I cannot literally be the body. Another argument. The experiencer and the experienced. In Sanskrit, this is called drashta and drishya, the seer and the seen. Notice, when I'm looking at this piece of paper, uh, it's seen. I am the seer. And the eyes which see the piece of paper, they must be different from the paper. They cannot literally be the same thing. In fact, the only thing that the eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves. See, here I can see everything except the eyes themselves. Say, Swami, look at the mirror. In the mirror, I can see a reflection of the eyes. If I take a selfie, I can see a picture of the eyes. But the eyes, the way they see you and everything else directly, that way the eyes cannot see themselves directly. The seer and the seen must be different. This is a well-known principle in philosophy. That there can be no self-reflexivity. Fire doesn't burn itself. Uh, the knife can't cut itself. Uh, the screwdriver cannot unscrew itself. Uh, thing does not operate on itself. Katra, uh, uh, katri karma viroda in Sanskrit. It's grammatically wrong. It's philosophically wrong. So the seer does not see itself. Whatever the seer sees must be different. A different entity. Not just seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Now, so what? Apply this on the body. Can I see the body? Yes. You can see the body. You can see, touch, smell, taste, hear. Even the tummy is rumbling with hunger, you can hear the body. If all the five senses operate on the body, you are the experiencer of the body. Therefore, whatever you are, whatever I am, I cannot literally be the body because seer and seen, subject and object, must be different. So I am not the body precisely because it's an object of my knowledge. Then third, one more argument. There are like about half a dozen such arguments, but I'll give you only three. Third, um, sentient, insentient. In Sanskrit, chit jada. What does that mean? Notice we always think of ourselves as aware. Whatever we are, we are aware. And the what we are aware of, that is not aware. That means the, I am aware, but the body is not aware. Uh, there is a psychologist in, in, Ved, uh, in New York, Greg Good, who uses Vedanta for therapy. So he has designed these nice experiments. One is, he says, just look at your hand. And notice now, notice the experience. So I said notice, not just think, notice your ex experience. You feel that I am aware of the hand. There is nothing in my experience which suggests the hand is aware of me. The hand is not saying, hello there. No. 
It isn't. It's not aware of me. It's not aware of anything else. It's not aware of itself also. As far as my experience goes, phenomenologically, internally, what I'm experiencing, I am experiencing the hand. On which side, if I ask you, which side is consciousness? Which side is awareness? On my side, not that side. I am aware of it. It is not aware of me. So, aware, not aware. And not just this hand, that hand also. And the rest of the body, the tummy, the legs, the head, all of it is something that you are aware of. None of it is aware of you. None of it is aware of itself also. None of it is aware of anything else. You are the one who is aware of the body. You are aware, the body is not aware. Chit jada. How can that which is aware and that which is not aware, how can they literally be the same thing? They cannot be. You are aware of the body. The body is not aware. Therefore, you cannot be the body. All right. Three arguments. What do you do with them? Listen carefully. What are the arguments? There are many more. I have borrowed these from Aparokshanabhuti, but you find them scattered across Vedanta literature. Many. Um, Aparokshanabhuti has eight or nine such arguments. So, some of them subtle, some of them very simple, many of them intuitive. They are meant to persuade you to think, at least create a little space uh, psychologically between yourself, your self-image and the body. Changing, unchanging. In Sanskrit, savikara, nirvikara. Therefore, I am not the body. Uh, seer and the seen. Drashta, drishya in Sanskrit. Therefore, I am not the body. Uh, aware, not aware. Sentient, insentient. Chetana, jada, chit, jada. Therefore, I am not the body. And we say that, yeah, yeah, I know. You are tricking me. I never meant I am literally the body. But I am here in this body. I am embodied. I'm a person, I'm a mind, I have thoughts, feelings, emotions, memory, um, personal history. I'm a person, yeah, in a body, embodied. That's what I meant. Aha, so now you think you're a person, a mind, yes. Let's apply the same arguments to the mind. Does it work? Does the mind change? Oh boy, does it change. <laughs> so fast, so much. I was sleepy in the morning, cup of coffee, I'm alert. I was upset some time ago, now I'm calm. I was curious, now I'm bored. I hope you're not bored. Be curious, <laughs> the other way around. I was bored, now I'm curious. Uh, so the mind changes. And all in the matter of a few hours since you woke up today in the morning, till now, how much the mind has changed. Imagine over a lifetime, how much the mind changes. Thousands of thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories floating through. Imagine the mind we had when we were little kids, when, when you were 16 years old. We might be embarrassed to think of that. That was my mind. Was I thinking those thoughts? Were those my goals in life? That's how I spent my time, my days. Go further back, you'll be embarrassed even more. When you were, say, five years old. Imagine the mind of the baby, two years old, six months old. Babies do have thoughts, at least emotions, perceptions. How different it could be the mind of an alien. How different from this mind with words. Why can't I say, I was all of that? It's just like the body, I was all of that. Um, you, for to point, that he pointed out this book to me. I'm reading it now. It is a tiny little book about this whole concept of being aware of our inner states. Mind doesn't understand this. Mind and consciousness are not the same thing. Mind and consciousness are not the same thing. And uh, I'll demonstrate that to you just now. You are aware of the mind. The mind is not aware of you. And what a peculiar way of speaking. What do you mean the mind is not aware? The mind seems to be full of awareness. Whatever is awareness, consciousness, if I look into thoughts, feelings, emotions, that's what it is. If you ask a, an expert in consciousness studies, those who study consciousness today, and ask, what are you studying? They will say perceptions, thoughts, emotions, memory, things like that. No. Vedanta says, thoughts are not aware. You are aware of the thoughts. You, the self, whatever you are, you are aware of the thoughts. Prove it. Very easy. Think a thought. Swami, whenever I don't want to think, thoughts flood my mind. Now you are telling me to think no thought is coming. Blank. <laughs> Even that will work. But think a thought. I'll suggest one, two, three, four. A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D. Think. That's a thought. Are you aware of A, B, C, D or is A, B, C, D aware of you? You see, you're laughing. Correct. It's a ridiculous question. Of course I'm aware of ABCD. ABCD is just like mental talk. 
ABCD is not aware of me or of itself or anything else. I am aware of it. Clearly, all our thoughts, emotions, memories, understanding, even the sense of self, I, it is all functions of the mind and that's not aware of anything at all. Neither of itself nor of anything else, but you are aware of it. Consciousness is on your side, not on the side of thoughts. Chit jada. Conscious, not conscious. Sentient, not sentient. And I'm using sentient uh, awareness, consciousness indifferently because none of them really um, grasp what Advaita Vedanta is pointing towards. You know, there are words, many words in Sanskrit for it and just about no word in English for it. It's like they say Eskimos, this is supposed to have lots of words for snow. Because they live there, the varieties of snow and ice and so on. In English, we don't have that range. In Sanskrit, in Indian philosophy, Vedanta, Buddhism, Nyaya, many words are there for what I'm talking about. Chit, Samvit, Bodha, Chiti, so many. There's no exact equivalent in English. Pure consciousness, we say. So awareness or consciousness, you are aware, not thoughts. And mind feels very aware. It's lit up by your light. You are awareness itself. Light metaphor is often used. So you are awareness itself. By your light, the mind is lit up. You shining, the mind shines after you. I'm literally quoting from the Upanishad. Tameva bhanta manubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. You shining, everything else shines after you. By your light, everything here is lit up. Everything means you shining, the mind is lit up. Mind being lit up, the sense organs are lit up. By the sense organs, you experience the body and the world. You see, hear, smell, taste, touch. But the light behind it all is consciousness. Every day we sing here. When we're singing to the, the Kandana Bhava Bandhana, the hymn in the Arati, Jyoti Ra Jyoti Ujala Ridhi Kandara. Light of lights, which lights up my mind. Swami, you are mistranslating. The Ridhi Kandara, heart. Yes, but Buddhi Guha, Shankaracharya says, it, the heart means the intellect, the mind, our inner sense of understanding. That is lit up by what? By consciousness. What is that consciousness? That's what you are. But we are going to come to that now. So because sentient and insentient, I cannot be the mind. Then what am I? Uh, one thing is constant. One is that I exist, surely. That's what Descartes arrived at, his whole cogito project, that to doubt whatever could be doubted, finally found that I think. That's one thing that I cannot doubt. If I doubt that I'm thinking, that's also a thought. So the thinker of the thoughts exists. Vedanta would reverse it. I exist, therefore I think. I had this interesting experience. Uh, we are studying Descartes at Harvard University in, the, in a philosophy of mind course at Harvard University in Emerson Hall. And we came to that part. Uh, Descartes says, uh, in the meditations of Descartes, he says that, uh, I, that the cogito part, that I think, therefore I exist. So I asked, so when Descartes does not think, does he not exist? Suppose Descartes falls asleep, does he disappear? Does he pop into existence every time he wakes up or has a thought? Now, I exist, therefore I think. When I think, I, it shows that I exist. When I do not think, that also shows that I exist, because not thinking is also an experience. Experience of objects and experience of the absence of objects. Experience of thoughts and the experience of the absence of thoughts. So I exist, that is absolutely sure. There's no doubt about it. In fact, a philosopher, not very studied these days, Malkani, G.R. Malkani, he points out that Advaita Vedanta builds on the certitude of one's existence and shows that certain existence to be infinite. I think it's a beautiful way of putting, summing up what Advaita does. I exist, sure, no doubt. Everything else can be doubted, but my own existence cannot be doubted. Now, the problem is my own existence is a troubled existence. I have no prob I know I exist, but that's the problem. <laughs> I, I have poverty, I have uh, relationship problems, health problems, uh, 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 academic problems, professional problems. So I am surrounded by problems. My certain existence is surrounded by problems. Now, what Vedanta does is it shows that your certain existence is an infinite, unlimited, problem-free existence. That's what will be shown. So what am I? I am this 
certain existence which is also consciousness. This is called Sat and Chit. And this is defined in Upanishads. Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma. Brahman is unlimited existence awareness. Sat and Chit. Existence consciousness. You see, Sri Ramakrishna, he gave the beautiful example of uh, the washerman's diamond. So the washerman found a rock, a rather peculiar rock, and he used it to scrub laundry. Now I'm, I'm thinking about uh, washerman in India, the traditional washerman who will come to your house uh, with his um, donkey and take your dirty laundry, load it up on. The, nowadays he would come in a bicycle and load it, load up your dirty laundry on a bicycle and take it to the river bed, and there you don't want to see what he does to your laundry. <laughs> pounds it and then scrubs it but he gets it clean so this washerman found a rock and he used, used it to scrub um, dirty laundry it was diamond but he didn't know he was poor and uneducated but he knew it was strange enough to, that it merited some inquiry so he went to his friend the vegetable seller and asked him what do you think about this it's a pretty rock I'll give you 10 rupees for it luckily he didn't sell it for 10 rupees he went to somebody else more knowledgeable, finally ended up with a diamond merchant. And the point of the story is the diamond merchant told him, it's a magnificent diamond. I'll give you a million rupees for it. And so all the poverty of the washerman was removed. But notice, he always had the rock with him. He had the diamond with him. Not only did he have it, he was using it also. But what was he using it for? For scrubbing dirty laundry. He did not know what it was and what its value was and how it could completely transform his life. We have it all the time. We are it. And we are using it all the time. What are we using it for? We are using it for seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and touching. We are using it for, uh, for fighting, being happy, being miserable, being angry, being delighted. We are using it for science and art and religion and Vedanta. All of what we are doing in life consciousness. Notice, when you are seeing right now, are you aware or not aware? You're aware, you're conscious. When you hear, you're conscious. When you use any of the sense organs, we are conscious. When you shut our eyes and sit quietly and think, are you conscious or not conscious? You're conscious. When you remember something, are you aware, are you conscious? Of course. If you're unconscious, you couldn't remember. When you fail to remember something, are you conscious or not? You're conscious, you're aware. When you are emotional, angry, are you conscious or unconscious? You're conscious. All throughout, like a golden thread, runs the stream of consciousness in all our daily activities, in all that we do in life, in days, in the days and years of our life, one thing is constant. That is consciousness. Quite apart from seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, what you are seeing, what you are hearing, that's different. That comes and goes. But one thing is constant. Consciousness is constant. You're conscious. Continuously conscious. In fact, even to see God, to see Kali, Sri Ramakrishna had to be conscious. So no, Swami, read it carefully. He lost consciousness. He lost consciousness of outward things. If you ask him, he says, like con contemplating bodha, contemplating consciousness, does one become unconscious? Sri Ramakrishna says. Inwardly is full of consciousness. Consciousness is continuous. And Swami, here is something else they are talking about. Something extraordinary. Not our day-to-day -day humdrum. It is day-to-day. -day. It's the diamond. We are using it as a rock to scrub dirty laundry. We don't realize what it is. Advaita Vedanta wants to make show us. You see, Advaita Vedanta is not interested in the contents of our experience. Advaita Vedanta is interested in the very nature of experience, in that which makes experience possible. Somebody went to Swami and said, I have all these sorrows, I have all these troubles, I'm not interested in your troubles. The Swami shouted at him. And the man was shocked. That's so cruel. I'm not interested in your troubles, I'm interested in you. Which makes a gap between my troubles and myself. It opens up a psychological space. That I am not my troubles. I am not defined by my troubles. Physical troubles, uh, mental troubles, I am not defined by that. Those are the contents of my experience. They keep changing. One thing does not change is consciousness. Consciousness is always shining. When all things subside, 
and you fall asleep, nothing in the world, you're not even aware of the body, an entire dream world comes up, various kinds of dream experiences, consciousness lights up that. When that subsides, deep sleep, you say, ah, Swami, got you. There's no consciousness in deep sleep. In fact, in deep sleep, according to Vedanta, there is only consciousness. There is nothing to be conscious of. Or at most you might say there is a blankness. There are two ways of expressing it. There is no object to be conscious of. It's like light streaming from the sun through the darkness of space towards the earth. You look up there, it seems black. It seems dark. It's full of light. How do you know, Swami? When a comet passes through it, I think there was a report that this month we will see uh, thousands of uh, um, meteorites. But when a comet passes between the earth and the sun, you will find a glorious display, the tail of the comet, blazing display. Now, d does the comet come with its own light? No. It's just reflecting the light already streaming through space from the sun to the earth. So, it's shining with the light, which is already there. But without the comet, what did it look like? Dark. Black. Dark. Why? If there's light, why doesn't it look all, look all lit up? Because there's no object for the light to reflect off. Similarly, I'm conscious in, in deep sleep, but there's nothing to be conscious of. Notice, consciousness and mind are different. Mind has shut down and that's deep sleep. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep are not states of consciousness. They're states of the mind. Active mind with sense organs, waking, lit up by consciousness. Semi-active mind, cut off from the body and sense organs, dreaming within itself, lit up by consciousness, dream state. Inactive mind, hibernating, sleeping, lit up by consciousness, deep sleep state. So, but I, it's not true. In, in deep sleep, I don't feel I am in deep sleep. I'm conscious of nothing. If you thought that, then you wouldn't be in deep sleep. That's a thought. See, that's why it's so important to distinguish the mind from consciousness. Consciousness is constant, ever shining. Not only ever shining, notice, it is free of all the thoughts, feelings and emotions. Whatever comes and goes in consciousness. It's like when an early morning a beam of light comes into your room, sunlight. And you see the tiny motes of dust floating around there. You know, like Brownian motion, it's there floating around there. Thousands of little tiny, tiny motes of dust shining in that beam of sunlight. The first fresh morning sunlight. Like that, you are the ever-streaming, ever-shining consciousness in which, like tiny motes of dust, how many thoughts and how many ideas and how many miseries and tragedies, how many delightful things, they have all, they are shining, floating around and disappearing. You are that ever-present and ever-free consciousness, which is free of all the comings and goings of thoughts and emotions and ideas. How many bodies have passed away? How many lifetimes have passed, passed away? In Panchadash it says, Masabda Yuga Kalpeshu Gata Gammeshu Anekadha No Deti Nastameti Samvidesha Swayam Prabha Months have come and gone, consciousness shines, and years have come and gone, consciousness shines. Uh, lifetimes have come and gone, that one consciousness shines. And eons have come and gone. Universes have cycled and recycled into existence uh, and disappeared and again come into being. Consciousness shines. It neither rises nor sets. This one ever-present consciousness. Is it miserable ever? No. Is it uh, desirous, happy, fulfilled? No. All of that depends on the mind which is revealed by consciousness. What does it seek? Apart from the body, apart from the mind, what does consciousness need? Nothing. It's only in connection with one body and mind we have a whole range of needs. What is consciousness disappointed about? Nothing. What is consciousness guilty about? Nothing. What, what uh, spiritual project does consciousness have? I have to put my mind in samadhi. I have to go to uh, Vai Vaikuntha, to heaven. No. In fact, Ramana Maharshi, uh, there's a very cute story which I like about Ramana Maharshi, the great teacher of non-duality. Uh, he was, you teach, who am I? Find that out. So one simple devotee came to him, a simple man, and said to Ramana Maharshi, you know, I really don't care much for your who am I. 
I really love God, my Narayana, the Lord Narayana, I love Narayana. Is it all right? And Ramana Maharshi said, yes, it's all right. But um, after death, will I go to Narayana? Ramana Maharshi said, yes, you will go to Narayana. Oh, good. And will I see Narayana? Will I see God after death when I go to Narayana? Yes, you will see. I'll see God. I'll see Narayana. Yes. And will Narayana see me? Will he see me? Yes. Oh, God will look at me. Yes. Will he speak to me? Will he speak to me? Yes. God will speak to you. Narayana will speak to you. What will he say? What will he say? He will say, find out who am I. <laughs> no, that's actually classical Advaita Vedanta. There's something called Krama Mukti, sequential liberation. So if you're not liberated in this life, you go to Brahma Loka and then you get the knowledge that you are Brahman and finally liberated. So anyway, uh, so that one consciousness, it has no uh, spiritual, particular spiritual goal. And that's our original nature, which is already there. It's not in some far off heaven. It's not in some particular mystical state. It is in that far off heaven. It is in that mystical state. But it's also outside. In Nirvikalpa Samadhi, we come to a direct experience of that, and of, of our real nature. But not just in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. That's the point. One sadhu said in Uttarakhand that uh, if it is available only in Nirvikalpa Samadhi, he said in Hindi. Lo, apne pyare ko samadhi ke jail khane mein band kar diya. You have now locked your beloved, the Lord, in the prison cell of samadhi. That's available only there, not here. Advaita Vedanta is not meant for wiping out the experience of the world. It is meant for making you absolutely free, fearless, while experiencing the world. That you are consciousness, which is enabling us to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Uh, Ken Upanishad says, Kene shitam padadi preshitam mana, Kena prana prathama prayeti yukta, Kene shitam vacham imam vadanti, Chakshu shrotram kaudeva yunakti, which shining being, shining being, enables you, enables this mind to think, enables the speech to speak, the eyes to see, and the uh, ears to hear. What is he talking about? Consciousness. And so, it enables us to live life. Ashtavakra Gita, again and again, after talking about the highest nirvikalpa, I mean the, the uh, highest Satchidananda Brahman, the absolute truth, and then he always ends with uh, Sukhi Bhava, be happy. Sukham Chara, move about happily. That means, uh, engage in the world, do your work, in your family, in your um, workplace, in your spiritual life, everything can go on. In fact, everything is going on because of the presence of that consciousness. Not knowing it, only identified with the instrument of body and mind, we think we are trapped in samsara. So this inquiry, this stepping back, body to mind to the witness consciousness, again and again, that is the divinity within Knowing the benefits of this, that I cannot die, makes me fearless. What will I be afraid of? Knowing the benefit of this, that I have no particular expectation of anything in this world, because I am that which reveals the entire existence of the world. What do I need in this world to make me whole, to make me perfect? I am whole and perfect. It makes me not grasp at things. Knowing that this one consciousness, what can I hate? What can I disparage? What can I reject? It makes us calm, uh, makes us fearless. There's a word in Hindi, in Sanskrit, nirbad. There's no way of translating it. It, makes, it means um, obstructionless, limitless. Somebody said, I think it was Swami Vivekananda probably, who said, if you feel you want to embrace the whole world, you have felt God. And this being that one awareness, that makes you feel like that. The mind, when it dwells upon its real nature, which is that one consciousness, it, may, it gets that feeling of embracing the whole world. One more word, and then I will conclude today this uh, morning's talk. One is, um, there are two views of enlightenment. So, you know, there's a question of manifesting the divinity within. That was the uh, phrase used by Swami Vivekananda. 
to two views of enlightenment. One is something that I call the paradigm shift. The other one is what I call the ethical manifestation. And these are not my inventions. I got this. I was studying a paper on Buddhism at Harvard. You might think that in Harvard University, do they sit and talk about enlightenment? They do. <laughs> so, <laughs> at least in the philosophy department, they do. So, the paper was Buddhism. The Buddha is enlightened, but there are two sides to it. One side, let me apply it to Advaita Vedanta. I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am not even the ego, not the memory. I am quoting from Shankaracharya. Mano buddhya hankara chittani naham. What am I? I am the witness consciousness. Chidananda rupa shivoham. The limitless consciousness, ever fulfilled consciousness, I am. Now we understand the whole thing. We sing it often, but we understand the entire logic behind it now. I am not the mind, not the body, not the uh, intellect, not the ego. Why not? You, you, know, you know the arguments now, changing, unchanging, um, the, uh, the seer and the seen, and the conscious and not conscious, and, and there are many other t- ways of understanding this. And I notice that I am not that, they are things. And I am limitless consciousness. So this is enlightenment. This is called the paradigm shift, not body-mind. Not the body, not even the mind, intellect, ego. I am the witness consciousness. Paradigm shift. I have shifted my entire con- self-conception. Not just in thinking. First in thinking, but also notice it. I will not even say, experience it. or No, notice it. It's already a fact. As you notice this, you can notice that. Notice it. When it, no, you notice it, it becomes a fact. But that's just one side of enlightenment. When we think about the Buddha, when you think about Swami Vivekananda, Shankaracharya, we want not only that that person knows I am witness consciousness, Shivoham, but also the qualities of a Buddha, the qualities of a Vivekananda, the qualities of a Shankaracharya. We want that in our life. The fearlessness, the uh, self-control, the, the compassion for everybody, the utter disregard of one's own little self, the bigness to encompass everything, that moral excellence. We want that. We expect that in an enlightened person. So that is called the ethical manifestation. And um, enlightenment must have both. If you have ethical manifestation without the paradigm shift, you're a very good person. That's all. You're not a Buddha yet. And if you have that paradigm shift without the ethical manifestation, something very wrong. <laughs> something has gone wrong. I knew a Swami. And the Swami is here, will know, I will not tell the name. <laughs> he was a great Vedantin, and genuinely great Vedantin. I knew him in his old age. Um, he had a hot temper. So somebody asked him, Swami, you're such a great Vedantin. Uh, why do you get so angry? He said, oh, anger, it is in the mind. I'm the witness of the anger in the mind. <laughs> uh, and, but I'm sorry, that's not very convincing. One sadhu said in Uttarakhand, Rota hua jnani kisko pat- pasand hai? <laughs> A jnani who is enlightened, but who has got so many complaints. I've got anger, I've got greed, these people are against me. And that, this is not a very good <laughs> convincing uh, advertisement for uh, Advaita Vedanta. So I am enla- enlightened, but I can't display any of the qualities of being enlightened. Something wrong there. So both must go together. Paradigm shift and Um, the ethical manifestation in my life. I must live that realization. All of this is beautifully captured by one word used by Vivekananda. Manifestation of the divinity within. Uh, That's why the word divinity, it sounds like an archaic English word, but it includes both our divine nature, but also the divine thinking, speech and behavior. That must manifest. So uh, this is Uh, enlightenment, manifestation of the divinity within. Okay, why do I need the second uh, lecture anymore? All this sounds great. (laughs) Now I must make a confession. At the risk of rotten tomatoes being thrown at me, I was pulling a fast one on you. Don't take anything I said seriously. Whatever I said now. Uh, The arguments I gave, changing, unchanging, seer, seen, conscious, not conscious, I am a consciousness apart from body and mind. That is the pure nature of the self. So I'm Vivekananda in one place, in practical Vedanta lectures, calls these childish arguments. They don't stand. 
There's a reason why we did that. In order to be clear that I am not the body-mind. But to think that apart from the body and mind, apart from this universe, there's some separate thing called an Atman, Brahman, consciousness, uh, separation. That is not Vedanta. It's entirely not Vedanta. And here I'm quoting Shankaracharya, after having done exactly what I have done, in great detail, showing that you cannot be the body, cannot be the mind, you are the witness consciousness, free of the body and mind, then he says, nothing whatsoever ever has been achieved by doing all this. He says, what more have we said, more than Tarka Shastra, more than Nyaya, the arguments which I gave you till now are not Vedanta. They are Nyaya, and they are, uh, some of them are Buddhistic arguments, and they are Sankhya arguments. If you stop here, you end with a duality. Do you not see? I am consciousness. Conscious of what? Mind, apart from me. Body, apart from me. World, apart from me. And this leads to an alienation. I am separate from everybody and everything else, including my own body mind. Now that understanding that I am not the body and mind, that's the valuable thing. But this separation is not non-duality. How is it non-duality? It's, it's absolute duality. Sankhya system is a dualistic system. This is where we have arrived. To know where we take this, how does non-duality achieve, what is wrong with this view, and how is non-duality achieved, how does Vedanta and Buddhism meet? Afternoon session. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu